on the lifeguarding classes we teach CPR first aid section, we teach at the pool the rescue technique section, and we teach preventing. See, if I ask any experienced lifeguard, let's say two years of experience, how many times did you actually do CPR on somebody? You, usually the answer is never. It doesn't happen that often. If you ask a lifeguard that has experience, how many times did you jump in the water to save somebody? Unfortunately, in about two years, three times is kind of an average. But if you ask a lifeguard, how many times did you actually prevent an accident by enforcing the rules? They're going to tell you every single day. So what's the most important thing on the lifeguarding class? Learning how to prevent accidents. Because this is what actually you're going to use every single day. So if you become good at preventing, you're never going to even have to jump in. Because you usually jump in when you fail to prevent. So what is the lifeguarding job? To prevent and respond to accidents. The best way to prevent accidents is to never assume but to predict the options, to predict the outcomes, and then you prevent the bad ones from happening. Lifeguards are to prevent and respond to accidents. That's the shortest, most professional answer. No, you're not, your job is not to rescue people. You're not, your job is not to babysit. Most of the parents that come to your pool, they don't read lifeguard, they read free nanny. <laughs> Au pair. Okay, they think you're there to watch their, their children. Remember one thing, parents are legally responsible for their children. Feel free to tell them that. So your job is to prevent and if you fail to prevent, you might end up responding. Now let me tell you right away, 95% of all problems you can prevent. You can prevent 95% of all problems in your life and during lifeguarding. The only 5% of the problems you cannot prevent is somebody having a seizure, stroke, any kind of medical emergency. That's why we learn how to scan the pool, how to search the pool, how to see in the first 10 seconds and help that person out. Everything else you can prevent. There was nobody to teach me this when I started this 20 years ago. That's why I had to learn through many mistakes and I create my own system. The best advice I can give you, not only for this job, but for life as well. My best advice I can give you is to never assume predict and prevent. This is the little algorithm that you need to have in your head when you're making any kind of decision. Even the de decision, should I turn right or turn, turn left? Any kind of decision in life, not only lifeguarding, you should kind of render through this algorithm quickly and that will give you the best solution. Now, we as human beings, we already do this every single day. This is nothing new to us. Although I wish there was somebody to teach me this when I was 15, I would greatly appreciate this. This would be one of the best advices ever. We already do this every single day. For example, when you want to walk across the street and it's red light for the cars and it's green light for you so you can walk, Will you continue texting as you are walking across the street? Because you're not going to assume everybody will stop. Okay? You're going to predict that maybe a car will not stop or not see you and you're going to put the phone away and use your senses and your eyes, your ears to safely walk across the street. See? You just made a correct decision using this algorithm. The same thing, you're driving a car on a highway, if you want to switch to the left lane, you can assume there is no car in your blind spot because last time you checked there was nobody over there. And you're going to switch lanes. And guess what? You're going to assume correctly 50 times. But the 51st time, there will be somebody over there, you're going to cause a major accident, 
that will cost you money, time, health, maybe life. And this, this will set back your life years. The whole goal for life is to move forward every day. Even one step forward is better than one step back. Every single day you need to go forward. And this will help you. This decision making will help you make those correct decisions. If I want to switch to the left lane, I'm going to predict maybe there is somebody in my blind spot and I will prevent by doing what? Giving the signal, checking my mirrors, turning my head, checking my blind spot, safely switching the lane. Predict and prevent. How do we use this in lifeguarding? Don't assume when somebody comes to your pool that if they look normal, they know everything you know. One thing we're gonna also talk beside predicting and preventing is patterns of behavior. Every group of people have a pattern of behavior. Four or five years ago, I was sitting at one pool in Bethesda, in like the hotel, I don't know, Hyatt or something. 20 minutes until the pool is over, I was excited to go home, like everybody does. So, a group of girls start playing categories, where one girl is outside of the pool, facing away from the pool, guessing the colors, that, and the girl was standing about six feet from the edge. And I'm sitting on my lifeguarding chair, and I'm thinking now, when she turns around to, go, to jump in the pool, she's gonna make two or three steps faster, and there is tiles, and she will slip. So that image went through my mind. So I predicted it. But guess what? You didn't do that. You know why? Because I, I told to myself, come on Nash, don't be paranoid. Let the kids play something that actually went through my head. Guess what happens in the next 10 seconds? She Boom! Face on the edge of the pool. Blood everywhere. I would prevent that if I just told her, be careful. Nothing else. If I just told her, tiles are slippery. Or come closer to the pool. Usually you prevent accidents just by talking to people. That's all you need to do. That's why we have pool rules. So we can explain that to them. Predict and prevent. Most of the pools you guys gonna work are either outdoor single lifeguard pools, outdoor multi lifeguard pools, that's in the summertime, hotel pools, they work in the winter or summer, and pools that belong to the gym, like LA Fitness, Export, 24 hour fitness pools. How do you prevent accidents on these pools? So you need to know some of the information. Let's talk about the gym pools. What is interesting to know about the gym pools? Good thing about the gym pools is most of them are just four feet deep. Maybe five feet tops. That's a good thing. Chance that adult person will drown classically in four feet, eh, almost not possible. It is possible that they have a medical problem and that's another thing that can happen at the gym pools because people come, they exercise, they want to lose weight in like two days. So they exercise for two hours, then they sit in the steam room, in the sauna, then they sit in the jacuzzi, they overheat, now they enter the water and they have a stroke or heart attack. Those things can happen. The typical drowning at those gym pools, not very often. People having medical problems, very often. Then what else can happen? Diving. People think they can dive in four feet, they make a mistake, they hit their face. Good thing about the gym pools is no children. Less children, less chance of something happening. What do you need to know about the hotel pools? You don't have pool passes, classically. You don't have to check the pool passes because usually only people that are sleeping in a the hotel, they can use the pool. Now, what is the bad thing? You're gonna have different people every single day. So you cannot teach the people the pool rules and now they know and you're done. Every single day, brand new people. And another challenge that you have, you're gonna have people from all over the world. You're gonna have people from all over the world coming. So whatever is logical for you, not logical for them. The bad thing about the hotel pools and the gym pools is you don't have any breaks. You don't have official breaks. If you work Saturday and Sunday, you work 12 or 14 hours, no official break. 
Now, the good thing about the hotel pools is more than 50% of your working time, there is absolutely nobody. So you're gonna have, you're gonna have the whole day sometimes not a single person come. But that's why you're gonna have other days, usually holidays, when hotels are packed. So for hotel pools, be ready. You know, prepare your snacks, prepare some drinks, be ready. But if you have people swimming for a couple of hours and you need to use the restroom, guess what? You will ask them, hey guys, I need to take a couple of minute break. Can you just come out of the pool and sit on the chair until you use the restroom? Never leave people in the water and you go somewhere. Never even turn your back to the pool. Predict and prevent. Now, if you work on the outdoor pools in the summertime, this is very important. You need to check the pool passes. That's how you prevent accidents. People with no pool pass, they don't come in. Remember that. That's number one thing. Good, good thing about the summertime pools is you're going to have the same families. So you teach them the rules, usually they know you don't have to repeat it. Usually the problem happens when you have somebody brand new coming and he wants to enter without the pool pass. Now, in the summertime, if you work alone at the pool, every 45 minutes you have 15 minute break. That means the last 15 minutes of an hour. So if you open the pool at noon, your first break is 12.45 until 1. Only physical tool to prevent accidents is the whistle. Use the whistle. People respect you more when you use the whistle. No headphones at the pool. Not even one headphone. Not even when there is nobody at the pool. First of all, it's not professional. Second of all, you need to be aware of your environment. Now, when there is no people, can you play some music off your phone? Ask your supervisor, most likely yes, as long as it's family appropriated music. Reasons to close the pool, this is important. So if you see a, or hear a thunder, you need to close the pool for at least 30 minutes since the last thunder, unless your supervisor tells you differently. If it's raining so hard that you cannot see under the surface, the pool is closed. If the pool water is cloudy, milky, foggy, white, you don't see the body on the bottom of the pool, you close the pool. So if the pool is so cloudy that you cannot see the deepest part, the main drains on the deep end, the pool is closed because you're not able to see a person under the water and you call your supervisor. Anytime you need to uh, close the pool for an emergency, you tell this to your supervisor and he makes the final decision. Also, you need to close the pool if there is uh, a diarrhea incident. Diarrhea is any poop that breaks. It doesn't have to be liquid from the beginning. So in case of diarrhea, you are required to close the pool for 12.75 hours. So in case of diarrhea, you need to get all the swimmers out and the pool is closed for 12 hours and 45 minutes. You tell that to your supervisor. You clean what you can clean and then you need to shock the pool. Shocking the pool means you increase the chlorine level three to five times higher than normal level for the whole 12.75 hours. Because in diarrhea there is bacteria called cryptosporidium which is chlorine resistant bacteria. You also need to close the pool if there is solid stool. So if there is poop, vomit, blood, dead animal, you close the pool but you usually need to close it only for half an hour and you need to keep the chlorine normal in the pool. Although usually when you tell that to the supervisor, he's gonna tell you close it for one or two hours. What is the first thing you're gonna do when you open your pool before people come in? You're gonna inspect the pool deck. My advice is always make a walk around the pool clockwise then walk counterclockwise. That's even before anybody comes. Why? Because inspect under the tables, under the chairs, Look for glass, nails, uh, screws, pieces of plastic. So many times I found those sharp objects on, on the pool deck. And there is more chance of somebody 
hurting themselves on those things than actual drowning. Clean whatever you need to clean. Remove any obstacles. If you find a problem that you cannot fix, what kind of problem that can be? Maybe a tile is broken or there is a metal rod sticking out of the pool deck. You cannot fix that. So what can you do? Take a, a sign or take a cone and put it over that spot and call your supervisor. Tell your supervisor that there is a problem that you cannot fix and then it becomes his problem. Very important thing. If you don't have anything, take a chair and put over that problem. It doesn't matter the chair is on the middle of the pool deck, it prevents the accident until somebody fixes the problem. Also, when there is absolutely nobody in the water, it's easy to see what's happening on the bottom. So sometimes you're gonna find people jump over at night, drink, they broke glass, there is glass. In case of the glass, pool is closed and you tell your supervisor. Predict and prevent. What is the biggest distraction for a lifeguard at the pool? The biggest distraction for a lifeguard is his cell phone. This is your worst enemy at the pool. If you work on a multi-lifeguard pool, you can always have a manager on duty and they will not let you bring this to the lifeguard chair. Most likely you're gonna work on a single lifeguard pool and guess what? You're gonna abuse this. So you're sitting on the chair with your rescue tube, you leave the phone on the table next to you, that's the most common thing that happens. Not correct thing, please don't do it. And guess what, you're scanning the pool, you're watching the children, and every couple of minutes your phone vibrates or rings. And guess what your body does automatically? Right? Mm -hmm. Even when you're driving your car, you know, who cares about the road? Let me check the phone. Our minds are now freaking trained. As soon as the phone lights up, we drop whatever we are doing there for that. Now, it's enough for you not even to touch it. You're like checking out, reading, what's, oh, okay, oh. five, six seconds, you just read what's going on. Not important. But guess what? Six seconds, I was not watching the pool. Child can easily drown in five, six seconds and go to the bottom of the pool. That, and I'm not going to even tell you about, okay, it's the end of the day and the lifeguard usually like hides the phone behind the, 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 the rescue tube and he's like scanning the pool. <laughs> Nobody sees, no, I'm invisible. <laughs> Next thing that you're going to use to prevent accidents is to learn, understand and implement the pool rules. Here on this paper, you're going to see something that I called best of pool rules by Nash. That's me. <laughs> now, why did I call it best of pool rules? Because I just put 14 of rules that I think they cover everything. Maybe on your pool, you're going to have seven rules. Maybe you're going to have 60 rules. So what is the first rule? First rule is actually a definition of the lifeguarding job. It says, lifeguards are to prevent and respond to accidents. This rule is written so you know what your responsibilities are and you can use this rule to explain to the ignorant guest about your duties at the pool. Because a lot of parents that come to your pool, they don't read the lifeguard on your shirt. They read babysitter. <laughs> they, they read free nanny. Au pair. They think you're paid to watch their kid. And they bring their kid to the pool so they don't have to worry about it for one, one hour or two hours. And unfortunately you have to educate those parents explaining that your job is to prevent and respond to accidents. And it would be best if you can predict that. That would be the best thing because it's easier to prevent. Especially if you work in the hotel pools you're going to have different crowd, you're going to have different people coming every single day and you're going to have people from all over the world and that's a great challenge. See, most of the people born in the United States, they more or less know these rules. But don't be counting that people from other countries know and this is logical for them because it's not. Second pool rule on the board is the most important pool rule. Child that cannot swim must be within arm's reach of the adult at all times. Why is this the most important rule? Most of the accidents that happen 
they happen with small children and they usually happen because young parents are not paying attention to their kids. Majority of your problems happen with small kids and usually they're going to happen in three and a half or four feet of depth. That's the most dangerous depth of the pool. This is going to happen every single day. You're going to have a young mommy with maybe two kids coming up to the pool and she leaves the kids in the shallow end. Usually one of the child is maybe six, the other one is nine. And mommy sits on the lawn chair next to the pool reading a book or texting. And guess what? The older child is tall enough and he knows how to swim, so he goes in four and a half feet, but the younger brother falls and you end up jumping. And this happens every single day. Every single day you're gonna see ignorant parents not paying attention to the kids. So as soon as you notice, first of all, you can ask parents, can the kids swim? But if the parent tells you yes, that doesn't mean anything to you. Okay, because when you ask a parent, can your child swim, he says yes, because parent thinks that if the child swims from here to here, that's swimming. <laughs> so never trust the parent. So if the parent tells you yes, he can swim, then you suggest a swim test. And swim test is swimming one length of the pool and being able to tread the water, to stay on top of the water for at least 45 seconds. That's a swim test. If the, if the child cannot swim or they cannot pass the swim test, you tell the parent to be within the arm reach of the child. That means the child needs to be no more than four feet away from the parent. This is the most important rule. You're gonna enforce it every day. If you don't, you're gonna end up jumping very often until one day you don't see it. What is the third rule? Lifeguards are authorized to enforce any rules necessary for the safety and operation of the pool. This rule tells you that you're not only obligated to follow the rules on the board, you can create the new ones, you can cancel the existing ones. Let me give you an example. You work on a small pool, three to five feet. Diving is not allowed, but they can jump feet first. But if today you have about 20 people in the pool or more, even jumping becomes dangerous. So it's your job to prevent any accident. So you can stand up, blow the whistle, say, excuse me guys, no more jumping, there is too many swimmers, it's dangerous, thank you. Guess what, you just cancel the rule. You have the authority to cancel the rule because you don't think that's safe in that moment. And if an angry parent comes up to you and you're gonna always have an angry mommy or angry daddy, walks up to you and tell you, why my child cannot do that? I pay money to come here. Lifeguard yesterday, uh, let us do it, whatever that is. Your professional answer is, sir or ma'am, my job is to prevent accidents and I am authorized to enforce any rule necessary for the safety and operation of the pool. Beautiful professional answer. Because you first need to try to explain to the guest professionally. And if he still goes on attacking you, you ask him to leave the pool, call the security, call the manager, whoever you can call. Then we have the three most basic rules that you're going to be using every single day, 20 times a day. No running. Children will never walk. They always go fast. And if you have tiles, it's slippery. You can prevent so many injuries and bleedings by enforcing this. So you can blow the whistle, say walk please, or no running please, thank you, and always smile. <laughs> because when you enforce especially the rule no running, you actually have to raise your voice a little bit so they can hear you. And that sounds like you're yelling. Especially when people hear me with this strong accent that everybody thinks it's Russian and it's not. They think I'm yelling at their kids. Then, no diving. For diving to be allowed, the pool needs to be at least nine feet deep. No horseplay. Horseplay is any pushing, dunking, choking, chicken fights, any kind of rough housing that's called horseplay. So if you see two teenagers kind of pushing each other in the pool, excuse me guys, no horseplay in the pool. 
you can play something else, thank you. So the next rule is no glass, so don't let people bring glass bottles or glass cups. Because if it breaks, it flies everywhere and your supervisor will not like it that he needs to close the pool for a couple of days. Okay, it gives him a lot of headache. No alcohol beverages. That's pretty self-explanatory. No long breath holding. So don't let people hold their breath the whole length of the pool. Especially if you see a, somebody doing this before that. <sighs> this is called hyperventilating. And this can cause that he loses consciousness all of a sudden. Only US Coast Guard approved swimming aids. What is a swimming aid? This is one of the swimming aids or swim jacket or a floaty. How do you know is it US Coast Guard approved? It says right here, US Coast Guard approved swimming aid. So you can read on it or inside. This is only truly acceptable flotation device. Even this doesn't guarantee that the child will not drown. But if you see a child in the water with something like this, and mommy or daddy is sitting away, and you walk up to the father and say, excuse me, sir, child that cannot swim must be within the arm reach of the parent at all times. And the father tells you, yeah, but my child has a swim jacket. That really doesn't matter. Even with a swim jacket, the parent needs to be within the arm reach because swim jacket means the child is not a swimmer. Do you understand? But if you want, this is under your discretion, if you want to be very nice to the parent, you can say, okay, if that swim jacket is US Coast Guard approved, you don't have to be within the arm reach, but you have to sit at the edge of the pool closer to him. This swim jacket looks very similar, but guess what? The only thing that says here is made in China. Nobody guarantees the safety of this. They can use it, but the parent definitely needs to be in the pool within the arm reach. Water wings. Again, made in China. These kind of flotation devices will never be US Coast Guard approved. They can use it, but the parent needs to be in the pool within the arm reach. No more than three to four feet away from the child. This is never US Coast Guard approved. And this is the only flotation device not allowed in the pool. This is the only thing not allowed because they put a three-year-old here and three-year-old flips over. This is a kickboard. Kickboard is not a flotation device. This is a training device for somebody that knows how to swim, but he wants to improve his legs, his kick. So how are you going to recognize that? If the child is holding on for his bare life like this, that means most likely he's not a swimmer. But if the child is kicking with his stretched arms, maybe take, taking breaths on the side, you right away know that he's a swimmer and he's working on his legs. This is called a noodle. Noodle is not a flotation device. Noodle is a pool toy. And a lot of parents think this is a flotation device, so they put it under a four-year-old and they let a four-year-old go into nine feet and they lose it. Two times I saw parents making a pretzel and putting a two and a half year old in here. Also any bigger inflatable rafts or big beach balls are not allowed because they block your view of the pool. So if they ask you why, because you cannot see under those rafts. Next, 11, swim test. Swim test is super important and that's why it's blue. Swim test you can use for anybody. Usually we use it for children, but you can use it on adults as well. If you see an adult in the deep end and he's kind of doggy paddling, doesn't look that he's a strong swimmer, you have every right to blow the whistle, say, sir, can you swim? Uh, yeah, sure. Can you come out for a second? Can you do a swim test for me? Uh, what's a swim test? Can you start from three feet, swim next to the wall, all the way to the deep end without stopping and then tread the water for 45 seconds. If he cannot pass this, he's not a swimmer. If adult person is not a swimmer, he can stay in the pool but no deeper than his chest. 
That's the safe depth for him. If the child is not a swimmer, he needs to stay within the arm reach of the adult. So also if you see a child and you ask a parent to be in the pool and the parent claims that the child can swim, you offer them a swim test. Also, if you have a bigger group, and listen to this advice, very important. <clears throat> Sometimes you can have big groups, like a whole school bus comes in, or a birthday party and there is a lot of kids. This is how you, this is how you manage this situation. So you see a big group of people coming in with kids. Blow the whistle, introduce yourself, ask who is in charge of the group. There is always a teacher in charge or a parent that brought them. Make sure that the parent understands that he is responsible for the group, not you. That person is responsible for all of them. And then you're going to tell them the basic rules. You're going to say, hey guys, let me just explain you the basic rules. No running, no diving, no horseplay. Why do you tell them this in advance? Because they will break it. They have a party. They're going to break the rules. That's why they came. It's fun. So you tell them in advance. So the next time when they break it, you can tell them one more time and the next time you start removing them out of the pool. And now you ask them, is there anybody that cannot swim? And guess what? There is a smart kids and there is smart parents. They're going to tell you, my boys cannot swim yet. Okay, sir, can you just sit here for a second? Everybody else, I would like to give you a swim test. What's the swim test? Well, you're going to start from three feet Swim next to the wall, to the deep end, and tread the water for 45 seconds. You're going to explain them what the swim test is, and you're going to tell them that they will go one by one. That's very important. And then you ask them, who wants to go first? And they're going to be like, me, 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 me. They think it's fun. They think it's a game. Parents loves it because they see that you're engaging with the kids, doing your job. And guess what? You're actually helping yourself. See, you are not assuming, you're predicting that there might be a couple of extra ones that cannot swim and you're preventing the accidents by using the swim test. Children less than 12 must be accompanied by adult. Every pool has an age limit. Usually it's 12, but maybe at your pool children under 14 or 16 will not be allowed to come alone. But I usually the minimum is 12, so anybody under 12 must be with an adult at the pool deck, regardless of swimming. Next, parents and guardians are responsible for their children. This is one rule that parents are supposed to know, but they don't. Parents are legally responsible for their kids. And the last one, parents are the first responders. Parents are supposed to be the first responders. That's the parent's job, that's the parent's duty. The parent needs to be in the water if the child is not a swimmer and the parent needs to react first. That's why your job is to educate them on these rules. Now, how are you going to enforce the rules? So let's say, for example, somebody walks in with beer. You're going to say, excuse me, sir. Then you're going to apply the rule. No alcohol allowed on the pool deck. Number three, you're going to tell them because it's the pool rule. Number four, you're going to suggest the solution, which is, sir, you can finish your beer outside if you like. Thank you very much. You resolve the problem in less than 10 seconds. Or, there is a child in the pool that most likely cannot swim. You walk up to the parent and say, excuse me, sir, child that cannot swim must be within the arm reach of the adult at all times, because it's one of our pool rules. You can be in the water with your child or your child can maybe pass a swim test. Thank you very much. Now let's talk about important thing. How do you recognize a swimmer or non-swimmer? Doggy paddling usually means they don't know anything more than that. Grabbing onto the edge of the pool and even worse trying to go deep. Not putting the face in the water that means they're not comfortable with the face in the water. Standing on their toes. Having flotation devices and sometimes being overconfident. If you see a kid with like scuba mask and fins and uh, the flotation device, usually that's called overconfident child. Usually he's the first one to tip over and start drowning in the water. Never assume, predict and prevent. Every day in United States, four to six children, ages between four and six, fatally drowned in four feet of water, usually after 4 p.m. 
and no more than 30 feet from the adult who is responsible for them. There is about 11 people drowning every day in the US, half of that children. And uh, drowning, unintentional drowning is the number one cause of uh, deaths in ch young children. Most of these children are between four and six because that's the age where parents already let the child play a little bit away from them and usually that's the child where the well, that's the age where the child still cannot swim and the worst reason is that usually children between four and six are just tall enough they're just tall enough to stand in three feet and the water is up to here and the parent think oh it's three feet it's shallow end that thinking that it's shallow end it's shallow for the parent but for a five-year-old that cannot swim three feet is not a shallow end. It's about two steps away from disaster. But the bottom line is that the parents are not paying attention. And I'm gonna tell you why they're not paying attention. It's called ignorance. It's called lack of knowledge. Throughout the school system, people receive zero knowledge about drowning, recognition and drowning prevention, zero. There is no class in high school or college that teaches for 20 minutes how the drowning looks like and how to prevent it. That's the reason why parents are not paying attention because they don't understand how it looks like at all. And to make the things even worse, we all learn from the television. We all learn from movies and cartoons, even when we are kids, when we watch cartoons like Spongebob or Mickey Mouse and they show somebody like drowning, it always looks like this. Help me, help me. You have to understand that those parents grow up with an idea in, in their subconscious that drowning looks like splashing the water and calling for help. Guys, this is complete lie. This never happens in real life. This is the reason why parents are so ignorant, why they're so relaxed next to the pool. That's the reason why. And I guarantee if they would include this in the school system, only like 30 minute lesson, that you would see that uh, the death toll of those children will drop significantly. What parents don't know, because nobody told them that 95% of the drownings are silent, and the child can actually sink under the water in zero to six seconds. I saw this many times. This usually happens in late afternoon and no more than 30 feet from the parent. Everybody has a parent in the behavior. Why most of the accidents happen in late afternoon? Late afternoon, you're gonna have more people. That means more chance for accident. Late afternoon, if you work outside, the sun is setting, you have glare, and usually you have like shades of the trees falling, you cannot see every, very well. Late afternoon, the most important reason that accidents happen in late afternoon is you are tired. Lifeguard is tired. And if the lifeguard becomes tired, what happens with your vigilance? What happens with your attention? Now, can you predict that you will get tired? Yes, you can because you're a human being. If you work a long day, whatever job you work, you will be tired. Any job you do, you will be tired, okay? Now, how can, how can you minimize that? How can you prevent an accident? Drink enough water, drink coffee, energy drinks, whatever keeps you awake. If you have breaks, take a shower. If you're allowed to swim on your breaks, swim, do push-ups. But the most effective and easy way is just stand up. Stand next to your chair. Don't be sitting if you're tired or sleepy. It's not good to walk around because then you're going to have a lot of blind spots. But you can stand next to the edge of the pool. And definitely you will not fall asleep. Now when you know this, you can predict it and you can prevent it. Everything that you can predict, you can prevent because now we know the statistics. What is the next one? Most of the accidents at the pool happens when the lifeguard makes three or more mistakes. 
when you make three or more assumptions or mistakes a day, the accident is about to happen. Accidents do not happen accidentally. Accident is always a consequence of your actions or your assumptions. I noticed that there is a pattern of four mistakes that keep repeating in every single death by drowning. There is four mistakes that keep repeating. Mistake number one, in all of these cases, lifeguard were not sitting where they were supposed to sit. In all of these cases, the lifeguard was not even scanning the pool. Even, like I said, if you make a huge mistake and not sitting where you're supposed to sit, at least use 1020 scanning searching method. Lifeguards were not enforcing the rules. And usually there is two rules that, uh, that brings you into trouble. Either you don't tell parents that they need to be within the arm reach of their non-swimmer child, or you don't swim test somebody. And in all of these cases, the lifeguard did not have his personal protective equipment with him. All of these lifeguards didn't have a mask and gloves with them at all. They didn't bring it to work. Not sitting on the correct spot, not searching the pool, not scanning the pool, not enforcing the rule and not having his equipment with him. A couple of years ago, a pool like this, with two lifeguards, a 15-year-old girl died on a two lifeguard pool because lifeguard made about nine or ten mistakes. Mistake number one, both lifeguards came, both of them clock in to get paid and one of them leaves. He goes to the coffee shop to get some coffee. <laughs> Mistake number two, this one lifeguard did not sit on this chair or this chair. He was sitting next to the gate, checking the babes coming in, checking the pool passes. Mistake number three, the girl was 15 on, and on that pool you need to be 16 to come without an adult. And he lets her in. Mistake number four, the girl was not a swimmer. She killed herself. She went from the shallow to the deep and she drowned. But there was supposed to be a lifeguard on the chair stopping her, giving her a swim test, telling her to stay in the shallow. Mistake number five, the lifeguard goes in front of the gate to smoke a cigarette. The lifeguard took a break. He had 10 people in the pool and he doesn't tell anybody that he's taking a break. He goes outside to smoke a cigarette. While he was smoking a cigarette, he hears people screaming because somebody found a dead body. Mistake number six, lifeguard never found a dead body. There was two guys that found the body and took the body out. Mistake number seven, lifeguard comes to help, lifeguard doesn't have a mask or gloves. Mistake number eight, the lifeguard remembers that he has an AED. He brings the AED, he presses the on button, but AED doesn't want to work. Later, we found out why, because AED had the tape over the battery and nobody removed that tape. You know when you buy something brand new with a battery, you need to move that paper? Nobody look at that. Guys, this is real life. This actually happened. But like I told you, there is a pattern in behavior and there is a pattern in mistakes. The lifeguards are not sitting where they're supposed to sit. Lifeguards are not searching the pool that they are supposed to do. Lifeguards are not enforcing the rules. And usually that's the rule, either a swim test or the parent needs to be within the arm reach. And lifeguard don't have his mask and gloves with him. In all of these cases, I notice that these mistakes repeat. Just don't do these mistakes. Because you know, usually what we see is, oh, I just went to the restroom for two minutes and that's when she fell down and hurt herself. No, that was just the last thing you did. If you enforce other rules and tell the mother to be within the arm reach and prevent it in the other ways, you going to the restroom for two minutes usually will not cause the problem. Let's move forward. Lung and whistle is the most important physical tool in preventing accidents. Buy a good whistle. One of the best whistles is, is Fox 40 Sonic whistle. Whistle is like remote control. 
like you're gonna control your TV from the couch. This is the way you control the whole pool and the pool deck from your lifeguarding chair. Everywhere in the world, lifeguard whistle. It's a normal thing. If you have two or three people at the pool, of course you don't have to whistle usually, but when you have a five, six, ten, a big crowd, you're gonna whistle. We don't yell at people, we whistle to get their attention. And when you whistle, whistle hard. You don't whistle for that person in particular, you whistle for everybody to stop what they're doing, to look at you, and then you point a finger at that person, say, sir, please don't do that, or go there, or come to me, or stop. Whistle is super important. And what I suggest is keep your whistle here, not even all, all around your throat. Keep the whistle in your hand and the rescue tube. So when you need to use the whistle, it's right here. You're not wasting any time. Because sometimes you're going to even use the whistle when you have one person. When you want to avoid a possible accident. So if you see a guy on the other side of the pool, next to three feet, for example, and he's preparing to dive, you don't have time to say, excuse me, sir, excuse me, excuse me. It's going to be too late. You need to get his attention immediately. So even with one person in the pool, you might end up using the whistle. In the United States, an average of 3,868 deaths per year. So we see how, how many people statistically drown in the United States. That means in average about 10 to 11 people a day. From that, uh, about 4 to 6 are children. So half of these are children. So in average about 10 people drown per day in the US, half of that are children. Now, let's look at the pattern of behavior. Why more people drown on weekends than on the weekdays? Statistically, if there is more people, more chance of drowning. Now, why more people drown on holidays? Usually on holidays, people barbecue, they drink. Right, They're more relaxed, they wanna have fun. Now, we have three major holidays coming, that is, uh, Memorial Day, 4th of July, and Labor Day. From these three, which one is the most dangerous? The first one, the Memorial Day. The Memorial Day is the day when most of the drowning happen. And let's talk about why, because this teaches us a lot about the pattern of behavior. First reason, Memorial Day is usually the first day when the outdoor pools are open. That means everybody will come. You're gonna have people on that weekend coming that you're never gonna see for the rest of the summer, but they're gonna come on that day, or th those two days. The other reason is, usually people are drinking. Then, usually those people that come didn't even swim for six months, or especially the kids, even if they knew how to swim last year, they didn't practice for a year. Another reason is, usually the water is still cold, and if it's a nice day, outside it's hot, the water is cold, and people will over, they, they will burn on the sun in like 30 minutes, but they wanna stay for five hours. And then they jump in the cold water. They're not gonna feel well, okay? They're gonna be exhausted for so many reasons. See, all of these, uh, these, these are the patterns. These are little things that add up. When I said there is three mistakes to lead up to an accident, see, there is these little factors that kind of snowball. It starts small and then it just picks up, picks up the motion until something bad happens. But the reason number one that so many people drown on Memorial Day is that most of the lifeguards are brand new. In May, a lot of new lifeguards finish the training and they start working on that weekend. They have zero experience to prevent and to stop this combination of all of that leads to more injuries and this is all predictable and if it's predictable it's preventable that's my point then this is a great statistic to learn from uh, laggard may appear to be rescue ready and effectively scanning but less than 10 percent of the laggards tested spotted a submerged silhouette mannequin within the 10 seconds of its placement on the bottom it took 1 minute and 14 seconds on average for Liger to spot the mannequin. Now this is the super scary statistic. 
In approximately 75% of drowning cases where a lifeguard was present, it was not the lifeguard that initially identified the victim. The submerged victim was brought to the attention of the lifeguard by another patron. In 75% of actual drownings, where the victim was already on the bottom of the pool, it was not the lifeguard that, that spot the problem. It was somebody else. That means this lifeguard didn't prevent an accident from happening. They didn't see a drowning person on the surface. They didn't see a body on the bottom of the pool. And that's why I'm going to teach you the next thing. From your lifeguarding chair or station, you need to be able to see all bottom corners of the pool. This is my personal definition. And believe me, this is one of the things you can do to prevent an accident. To position yourself correctly. Now, it's easy if your pool has one high chair. If your pool has one high chair, that's definitely the best spot. No question about it. So if you have one high chair, use that high chair. That's it. Don't sit on a small chair if you have a high chair. Now, the problem occurs if your pool has two high chairs and unfortunately only one lifeguard. Now you have a dilemma. Now you want to use a, a correct chair. Usually the pools are like this. Your job as a lifeguard is to be able to see all bottom corners of the pool. You need to pos your job is not to sit where you have those two swimmers or that one child in the pool. Your job is not to move the chair closer to that one child in the pool. Your job is to sit where you can see the whole pool in three dimension, the bottom corners, the bottom uh, edges of the pool. That's your job. And your job is to scan, to search the whole pool in 10 seconds. Not only to pay attention to these two kids. So even if you have two kids over here, you need to sit here because usually from this chair you can see the whole pool. And you might ask, what about these two kids? Well, if those two kids are not swimmers, ask the parent to be within the arm reach of those two kids. That's the parent's job. Your job is to swim test those kids, to see if they can safely uh, pass the swim test. If they can pass the swim, they will not drown because they're swimmers and they can use the whole pool. So your job is to find out if they can swim or not. If they cannot swim, the parent needs to be in the pool. If they can swim, they can use the whole pool. And your job is to sit where you can see the whole pool. That's how you position yourself. It's like a game of chess. You need to put the pieces together. A lot of pools don't have a high chair at all. Most of the pools are rectangular pool like this, especially not deeper than five feet. And you use the regular chair. So where are you going to put your chair? You're going to either put your chair on this side or you're going to put your chair on this side. There is no better position than this and this. This is okay position, but it's definitely not better than this and this. How are you going to decide? Are you going to put your chair on this side or this side? First of all, you want the sun to be behind your back. If the sun is in front of you, you're going to have glare. Or if you, have, if you work indoors and you have big windows, you, you would rather for the windows to be behind you so you don't have glare. The second thing is you want the gate or the door of the pool to be in front of you if possible, not behind you. So these are a couple of factors you want to take into consideration. Where you need to sit, you need to sit where you can see all bottom edges, the bottom corner of the pool. While you are sitting at your correct position, you need to actively search the pool or actively scan the pool. One of the best scanning techniques, it's called 1020. 1020 scanning technique. That means 10 seconds and 20 seconds. In 10 seconds, you need to stand or sit with your rescue tube and actively search the pool in three dimensions. That means I'm going to begin in the further corner and scan bottom surface, bottom surface, bottom surface. Now back through the middle, bottom surface, bottom surface, and I finish underneath my feet. So technically, 
it, if I'm sitting, if I'm sitting here, I'm gonna begin in this corner and scan bottom surface, bottom surface, back to the middle, bottom surface, and finish here. And then I begin again in this corner, bottom surface, bottom surface, bottom surface, and scan here. In 10 seconds, you need to scan the whole pool and begin again 10 seconds and again 10 seconds. This little moment defines are you lifeguarding or you're just somebody sitting next to the pool? Because it's so easy for your supervisor to spot this and for other guests at the pool to spot this. So if you have even one person at the pool, you need to be doing this all the time. Your head is moving, your eyes is moving. This is called actively searching the pool. That's your job, that's what you're paid for. If you're not doing this, you're not doing your job, period. You can do everything else correctly, but if you have people in the pool and you're not searching and scanning, you're not doing your job. Now, why do we need to scan everything in 10 seconds? Because most of the drownings happen in zero to 10 seconds. Usually adult people can sink to the bottom within 10 seconds. Usually children can sink to the, to the bottom, go disappear under the surface less than 10 seconds, more about six seconds. So if I'm scanning the pool within every 10 seconds, I'm increasing the chance that I'm gonna see the problem on the surface and I'm gonna have time to reach to them, give them the rescue tube, get them safely out. In most of the cases, you don't even have to call 911. But if you waited more than 10 seconds, most likely that person will be under the water. So my advice is, if you had to save somebody and that person was under the water more than one or two seconds, you calling 911. So usually what can happen at the pool is uh, mommy is in the water with a child and she was not looking for a couple of seconds. The child sink under the water, you jumped in, you pulled the child out, child is maybe crying, mommy thanks you. Guess what? You don't know did that child inhale the water. Nobody knows. Because there is something called secondary drowning. The, and symptoms of secondary drowning uh, occurs after 6 to 12 hours, even 24 hours after the incident. If the, the water goes in the lungs, the person can look just fine, but after 12, 40, 24 hours, they can experience headache, chest pain, diarrhea, vomiting, Usually that's when they go end up in the hospital and a lot of times those person, those people, those victims can die within four to five days after drowning. Okay, that's called secondary drowning. It's about 2% of all the drownings, but it does happen. So that's why in 10 seconds we need to scan the pool. Why do we need to rescue the person within 20 seconds? Because statistically within the first 20 seconds that person is still conscious. If the person is on the surface drowning for about no more than 10 seconds and they go under the water, they will still usually be conscious for about 10 seconds under the water. So you still have good chance to get them out safely. But after totally of 20 seconds, if you don't get them out, if they go unconscious, most likely the larynx, the throat will relax and they will inhale the water in their lungs. And now, definitely they're gonna end up in the hospital. So that's why the last line of defense is 10-20 scanning. That's the last thing you can do to prevent a serious problem. So from my own experience, and I saw more than 100 people drowning, they will sink to the bottom within the first 10 seconds. This is serious. And this is what a lot of parents don't know. And this is what even a lot of uh, new lifeguards don't know. Nobody teaches them. They think the victim will wait for them for like 60 seconds on the surface and that's not gonna happen. And definitely what most of the parents don't understand is that 95% of the drownings will happen silently. It's not like in the movies. In the movies you see it completely wrong. It's a false information. Silent means the drowning person will not be able to splash the water with their hands, like mo most of the people think, and they will not be able to call for help. Silent drownings we divided into three groups. 80% of the silent drowning victims will tilt their head back and have big afraid eyes. There is no spare breath to call for help, 
and they struggle just to keep their nose and mouth above the water, bobbing up and down. His mouth sinks below the water surface, pops up just enough to breathe and sinks back down. Stiff arms, instead of waving for help, his arms are underwater and out to the side. Hands pressed down on the water to keep him afloat. He can't even reach out to grab for flotation device. He will not be kicking, his body will be straight up and down almost like standing in the water. Absolutely correct. Every single information here absolutely correct. Majority of the drowning, about 80% of the drowning. So in 80% of the drowning the only thing you're gonna see coming out of the water is this. Just the face, tilted head back. And like they're gonna be bobbing up and down. They go under the water, they come up. This is the only body part that you see out of the water. Everything else you really don't see. And what you're gonna notice, tilted head, usually big afraid eyes. Those eyes you're gonna see, they always look for help. If it's a child, it always looks for mommy or daddy or they're facing the edge of the pool. If they have longer hair, you're gonna see some bangs falling over the face. And this is only if you notice them in those 10 seconds, guys. Their arms cannot go above the water. Because as soon as they lift their arms above the water, they start sinking even more. So it's not possible that they're raising their arms. And with their legs, they're either riding a bicycle, which is actually pulling them downwards, or in most of the cases, their legs are stiff, like two pieces of, of wood. And, and they're like making a tiny little movements with their legs. Probably in their head, they think they're kind of kicking, but their legs are totally cramped up. About 10% of the drowning victims will be silent because they will have some kind of medical emergency in the pool. Heart attack, seizure, stroke. Again, I know a couple of cases that this actually happened. Important thing is to understand this can happen with anybody, with good swimmers. Five, six years ago, uh, one of the pools I used to work, there was a 67 year old lady swimming laps and one lifeguard sitting at the pool, nobody else. I was off duty, I was on the other side of the building. Lifeguard was sleeping. So he was sitting with the rescue tube, his eyes closed. Lady was swimming nice and slowly laps until she had a seizure, epilepsy. So she started seizing, she never sink to the bottom, just went face down, started seizing, but there was no, no lifeguard to notice, he was sleeping. And eventually after a minute or two she stopped breathing and the heart stopped. At one moment the lifeguard uh, actually woke up and noticed a body in the corner of the pool. He goes around the pool, he takes his rescue tube and pokes the body a couple of times. Because he was thinking that the lady is making fun of him. He realized the lady is not moving. He pulls the lady out, there was a second lifeguard coming to help, no pulse, no breathing. They did CPR for four minutes, luckily the lady came back to life. She was in the hospital for three weeks, she survived. Another example, the same pool actually, the, the same year, there was a guy training for triathlon, very good swimmer, he's a beast. Every other day he swims for an hour and a half. All of a sudden he loses consciousness, he sinks to nine feet. Nobody knows why, exhausted or something. Luckily the lifeguard noticed him on the bottom, they pulled him out, they did rescue breathing, he's good. Also five years ago in one of the gym pools, a guy had a heart attack in the hot tub. You know, if you have a hot tub, your job is not to, to scan the hot tub, but always keep the hot tub somewhere where you can actually see it. So there was one gentleman in the hot tub, he comes there every day. He was alone in the hot tub, the lifeguard didn't notice how long was he there. After 10 minutes, the lifeguard stands up to check the chemicals actually, and he noticed a body just floating. Ambulance said he had a heart attack, but guess what? It happened in the water. It's drowning. 10, 15 years ago, one of the swim teams here in Alexandria, one of the swim teams, there was a young kid swim team, and the little girl had a seizure. There was, all the kids are standing in three feet waiting for the coach to give them uh, a next exercise, and one of the little kids starts seizing. Nobody noticed. She was, around, she was surrounded with other kids but nobody noticed, you know, because kids are having fun in that moment. She died. And this is not what you see in movies. 
This is not what anybody teaches us that it, that can happen. We always expect all oh, drowning, you know, somebody splashing the water, screaming for help. That will never happen almost. About 5% of the drowning victims will be silent because they will either jump or fall into the pool and instantly sink to the bottom. I personally had to save at least four or five people like this. And again, this is not something that anybody tells you. That a person can just jump and sink to the bottom. If you were not scanning the pool, you're not gonna see this. Because this is out of the mind. This is not normal that somebody will actually jump in the pool and just sink to the bottom. I had to pull a couple of adults and a couple of kids like this. We had a guy from India. He just came to the edge of the deep end. He jumped, sink to the bottom. We pulled him out, asked him, why did you do this? He said, I wanted to try. Then a couple of years ago, uh, a father was with his 11 year old daughter in the deep end and the lifeguard thought that he could swim because he was pushing from one corner to another corner. So the lifeguard looked to the other side because there was kids in the shallow end. And when he looked back to the deep end, there was no father anymore. He noticed the father on, on the bottom of the pool, on the main drain. He pulled him out, gave him a couple of breaths. He came back to life, thank God. Because the lifeguard was actually scanning the way I was teaching him. And he noticed him within the first 10 seconds and got him out. So you don't expect this. What happened to me was a uh, two and a half year old kid bends over. The girl was on the pool deck with street clothes. She bends over to touch the water and she just falls in face forward. Perfectly with no splash. Ma Luckily mommy noticed so she stood up and I at the same time jumped in. I went underwater to get the kid. The kid was still upside down the way she entered the water. Remember what I told you for the younger than three years old. They don't know what's going, what happened. The girl was still upside down the way she entered the water. Then also, uh, what happened to me? I opened the pool in the morning, a nice outdoor pool. The pool had steps like this. There was only one mommy sitting on the steps with a cell phone in the left arm. And there was about two, two and a half year old daughter right next to her. She had a little cap on. So the daughter makes one step, two step, three step next to mommy and just, just went under the water in like three feet of water, less than three feet of water. Her little cap stayed on the surface. Mommy didn't see because of her, she was holding the cell phone. It was right here. So I had to enter the water up to here to pull the kid up. When I tell you that children can drown in zero to six seconds, I actually mean zero. And if you're not scanning the pool, you're never gonna see this. Because this is out of the mind. Your brain doesn't accept the fact that somebody can disappear under the water instantly. Also, what happened to me four or five years ago, a family came in two older sisters and a younger brother with mommy and as soon as they enter the pool yay pool and immediately they jump in and the, the boy jumped in four and four feet with sisters and just stayed under so i was like did i did i see three kids entering because i just saw two two girls coming up and i noticed a boy's hair just floating like <laughs> under the surface that's it and a lot of times the parents don't even recognize that not only that they don't see sometimes they don't, they don't, don't recognize i had a woman looking at her daughter drowning and she's doing this come on honey come on you can do it come on come on and the daughter is <laughs> sucking in water i had to pull the kid out four feet of water and mommy got upset at me why did i scare her kid why did i touch her kid i was like ma'am your child was drowning no she wasn't then I had another case, a father was in the pool, his daughter was on the kickboard, she tip, uh, flipped over the kick, kickboard, went away, it was about four feet of water. The, the child was drowning and the father froze and he's looking at me. And I had to jump in to pull the kid out. And he got mad at me because I didn't do it immediately. Now you can predict it and if you can predict it, hopefully you will prevent it. Now. The, your movie drowning is about 5%, but listen to this, this is what they don't tell you. Only 5% of the victims will be active on the surface. They are usually weak, panicking swimmers. Remember, weak, panicking swimmers, not non-swimmers. Splashing the water and calling for help means that they are in panic. When they don't have strength to panic anymore, they will become silent drowning victims. Uh, if you have somebody that can even swim a length of the pool, 
maybe 20 yards they can swim but they are not able to tread the water they might trick you you see that person he was like okay he's not a good swimmer but he's a swimmer so you think like they're okay but as soon as that person for some reason stops in the deep end and he cannot touch the bottom or even worse they stop and they try to touch the bottom and they go under and now they start freaking out now the panic hits they those people might splash the water but they're not splashing to signal you they're splashing because they know that swimming is this or swimming they want to swim like this that's why it looks like they're splashing because they try to move forward and it doesn't work that's why it looks like splashing the water but this can happen with only people that are swimmers not great swimmers but swimmers usually these people can either save themselves or you just give them any kind of flotation device for, to grab onto or even a pole but if there is nobody to help them and they don't reach the edge of the pool they will become tired because they're not going anywhere after maybe 30 seconds a minute depending on a person and now they their hands will disappear under the water and they will become the silent drowning victim never assume now you can predict it and if you can predict it hopefully you will